It is indeed my um, profound honor to introduce you today um, to an old friend of Amet, um, Yoram Ettinger. Um, Ambassador Ettinger served as Israel's Consul General to the Southwestern region of the United States, based in Houston, Texas from 1985 to 1988. Um, he then was the Director of Israel's Government Press Office on 1988 to 1989. And in 1989, he rose to the rank of ambassador, um, where he served as Israel's Minister of Congressional Affairs at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, DC. Um, he is frequently interviewed by American and Israeli media, um, and he is a frequent visitor to the halls of Congress, where he is enthusiastically and eagerly um, awaited um, by many members of Congress and staffers. Um, he also is the co-founder of the American Israel Demographic Research Group, which has documented um, this more than one million person gap in the number of Arabs in Israel and Judea and Samaria. Um, so um, it is my profound pleasure to turn the podium over to your manager. My pleasure. Uh, the Hebrew word emet, which is truth, is very, very special because the spelling of emet uh, is three Hebrew letters. And uh, the first letter of the alphabet, one of the middle letters of the alphabet, and the last letter of the alphabet, which means truth is not part of reality. It's the whole thing or else it's... Uh, uh, misleading, it's a lie. And uh, every letter of uh, emet, of uh, truth, is uh, uh, its shape is very stable. Unlike, by the way, the spelling of uh, lie in Hebrew, where the shape of the letters is very unstable. And I mention all that because uh, we, we uh, commemorate today in Israel, uh, as we do every year, uh, fallen Israeli soldiers during our wars against uh, conventional military Arab forces and against Arab uh, terrorists. And uh, uh, commemoration uh, brings us back into the proper context of life. We go back to past record, we go back to history, we go back to our experience in previous years, and without reliance on past record and experience, uh, there is hardly present time, there is hardly uh, future. And that's the importance of commemorating uh, national uh, events and national uh, history. Uh, and one more word, we are going to celebrate tomorrow Israel's Independence Day or the liberty of the Jewish state. The Hebrew word for liberty, cherut, is part of the larger Hebrew, day, Hebrew word of responsibility, cherut and achrayut. And the message here is that if you want to earn liberty, you must display responsibility. And in order to display responsibility, once again, you have to rely you have to rely on the past you you cannot afford to ignore the past hence the uh, combination of liberty and commemoration which are the prerequisites of our personal life and national life as well uh, that uh, leads me to the topic of uh, today which is uh, demographics the jewish arab uh, demographic reality, reality in contrast with uh, misrepresentation, or I would say reality in contrast with conventional wisdom. There has been conventional wisdom for many, many years that uh, Jews are part of the Western society and therefore uh, they multiply in a very slow uh, pace. Arabs, on the other hand, are part of the third world society, 
and therefore they multiply in a much faster uh, pace. Well, that's conventional wisdom, but just like many cases of conventional wisdom when it comes especially to the Middle East, this one also contrast, is contrasted with a Middle East uh, reality. And the reality, before I move into the actual uh, data which I'm going to share uh, with you, the reality is that not only isn't there an Arab demographic time bomb, but in fact, in the last, during the last 15, 20 years, there has been an unprecedented, robust Jewish demographic uh, tail uh, wind. And to uh, provide one example again, before we move into the actual documentation of my uh, uh, thesis, so to speak, um, we are talking today about uh, fertility rate among Jews in Israel or number of babies per Jewish uh, women, which is higher than any Arab country other than Yemen, Iraq, and Egypt. Egypt is very slightly above the uh, fertility rate in, uh, in Israel. And for the last few years, number of babies per Jewish woman in Israel is higher than Arab women in Israel and higher than Arab women in Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West uh, Bank. Uh, another um, extraordinary uh, phenomena, extraordinary as far as conventional wisdom, but part of reality is the fact that that type of tailwind is not because of religious folks in uh, Israel. The real boost to Jewish demography of the last 15, 20 years has originated among the secular folks in Israel, which constitutes the very, very large majority of, uh, of Israelis. And more than that, Unlike every other Western society in Israel, the higher the level of education, the higher the level of economy, level of fertility does not get lower, but in fact keeps on moving upward. In every Western society, be it the US, be it in uh, Europe, the higher the level of education and, uh, and income or economy, the lower the level of fertility, not among Jews in, uh, in uh, Israel. And not only uh, that, but uh, Israeli Jewish women with higher education, Israeli Jewish women uh, who are older than 30 year old, are endowed with fertility which is higher than any other western society israeli women increasingly get married at an older age but right away they start their fertility process or reproductive uh, process the bottom line is that contrary to conventional wisdom we have experienced an unprecedented Jewish demographic tailwind, and at the same time, and I would say for all the good reasons, Arab demography in Israel itself, uh, in Judea and Samaria, uh, otherwise known as the West Bank, and throughout the Arab world, has gone through a very rapid westernization process, namely from a very high third world level of fertility, Arabs today in, the, in most Arab countries have a level of fertility which is lower, lower than the one among Jews in Israel and rapidly approaching the very, very low level of fertility uh, of Western societies. And this has happened because of uh, enhanced position of women in Arab societies, which has also had its effect 
on the fertility of Arab uh, women. And I would like from here to move to, uh, uh, to move to uh, sharing with you uh, the, uh, oh, uh, some technical uh, problem here, I assume. Yeah, okay. I would like you to follow with me a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which you have right now, I believe, on the screen. And again, that's not the just yet, Yoram. Sorry. Um, make sure that you click share so that we can all see it. Yeah. It's on the bottom of the screen. Uh, it should be share screen in green. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's. Uh, oh, Please stand by. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's going on here? Uh, oh, sorry. You, you don't see it right now? No. Why, why don't I get... Okay. But Yoram, you know the issues so well. Maybe you could just um, tell yeah. us what's in the PowerPoint. Let me try again. Okay. We'll let Yoram try for one more minute, and if that oh, doesn't no. work, then I can share from my computer. Oh, oh there we oh. go. Ah, wonderful. Excellent. So we yes. see your desktop. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> wonderful. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. It's called tenacity. Uh, tenacity, right. Just like the current health uh, challenge, we have to be determined and tenacious, and we're going to overcome and surge uh, again. Uh, this is the bottom line of the demographic reality. No... Arab demographic uh, time bomb. And how uh, have I arrived to that? Uh, I'm part of an American-Israeli team. We have been operating since 2004, studying the Jewish Arab uh, demography between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Again, the combined area of Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, and pre-67 uh, Israel. And uh, I'll start briefly uh, with the conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom today is not uh, something new, uh, talking about uh, pessim demographic pessimism. Uh, before the Declaration of Independence for Israel, the founding uh, father, Ben-Gurion, was besieged by the top demographers, top statisticians in Israel, who tried to educate uh, our founding father on the demographic reality and they try to convince him to delay declaration of independence because according to the so-called experts there was no hope for jewish uh, demography and very soon uh, we would become a minority in our own country the founder of the israeli central bureau of statistics submitted to ben Gurion in October of 1994, and according to that uh, document, by 2001, as you can see at the bottom of this document, 2001, no more than 2.3 million uh, Jews side by side with 4.4 million Arabs. And today, by the way, we are already 7 million uh, Jews, far, far above the, the most optimistic scenario submitted by the demographers to Ben Gurion. But our founding father had no degrees in statistics of demography, but he was much more in touch with reality. And he was aware of the potential of immigration or aliyah of Jews to Israel. He was much more confident about the future Jewish fertility rate. And as they say, the proof is in the pudding. He was right, and the so-called professionals 
were uh, wrong. Uh, Theodore Herzl had the same uh, fortune. When he came up with the Zionist idea, the first Zionist Congress in 1897, he was again besieged by the top uh, demographer those days, Shimon Dubnov, the top Jewish historian demographer, who uh, uh, ridiculed, ridiculed uh, Theodore Herzl, and he called uh, the Zionist idea a nice messianic uh, utopia pipe uh, dream, and he submitted his own uh, projection for uh, the end of the uh, 20th century, and he said by the year 1989, there could not be more than 500,000 Jews in Israel. Again, today we are 7 million Jews in Israel. Herzl, the non-demographer, the non-statistician, he was right. The so-called professionals were uh, wrong. Um, today, we hear very similar uh, projections about Jewish demography. And why are those projections wrong today? And I do not deal with projections of my own. I don't believe in projections. Projections are very subjective. Uh, documentation is objective. In 1997, the first Palestinian census took uh, place. And you can see on the right uh, of the document, June 1997, Palestinian Central Bureau Statistics Census, and they, they came up uh, with a number of 2.8 million Arabs in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza itself. That number was accepted without auditing. And I emphasize without auditing because until today, until today, the Palestinian numbers are not audited. They are reverberated as if they reflect through reality, it resembles a giant like uh, Lockheed Martin publishing its own uh, income statements, balance sheet, without auditing. No one would take it seriously. But when the Palestinians come up with their own numbers, everybody accepts it as if it is carved in uh, rock. And this is not the case, as we found out, we the three American, six Israelis, which have been researching it since 2004, we actually have audited the Palestinian numbers, the Israeli numbers, and international numbers. And for the 1997, we found out that while the Palestinians came up with 2.8 million, on the left, you can see the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, its last, its last uh, uh, statistics for the Arabs in Judea Samaria was 2.1, uh, uh, 700,000 uh, difference. We found out also that the Palestinian Election Commission and the Palestinian Health Ministry, as you can see in the document, came up with numbers very close to the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, much lower than the Palestinians. But again, no one bothered to examine it, and therefore they were unaware of that. We decided to find out how come there is such a gap and who is right. Maybe the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics is right. In our, the process of our, of our auditing, we came across a press conference which was held in February 1998, and the head of the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, he acknowledged that the Palestinians have a different way of counting. It sounds maybe funny, but this is the reality. Namely, according to the head of the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, they also count people who are away from Judea, Samaria, or Gaza for over a year. All over the world, the rule is very clear. An American, British, French, Israeli, you are out of the country, whether for job purposes, traveling purposes, consulting purposes, whatever, studying purposes, you are out of the country for a year and a day, 
on that day you're deducted from the count. It does not affect your privileges as citizen of your country, but you're not counted because you are away for a year and a day, and another country is counting you as a permanent resident, as a resident, as a citizen, and you cannot be doubly counted. There's one exception. The Palestinian Authority, they also count not all Palestinians who are away, but some of them. And again, in 1997, it was 325,000 according to their own documentation. And later on, as uh, you'll see, there have been more such uh, evidences. And today we're talking well over 400,000 who are away from Judea and Samaria, but are counted as if they are in Judea and uh, Samaria. Uh, we also talk about the Palestinian website of the 1997 uh, 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 census. And on the website, they also stated that while they follow the de facto approach, but there have been some exceptions. And what are the exceptions? As you can see in the document, highlighted Palestinians who live abroad for more than one uh, year. Uh, uh, to their credit, they are not cheating anyone. They are counting differently. The problem is that our team was the first one to audit and therefore the first one to uncover that different way, an acceptable way of uh, counting. Uh, we are talking about uh, the Palestinian Ministry of Interior. And again, in 2014, the uh, uh, deputy or undersecretary of the interior of the Palestinians admitted, admitted that at least 100,000 children who were born abroad are registered as if they are part of the population in Judea and uh, Samaria in the West Bank. Each one of them has uh, two uh, parents. Then you have parents who do not produce children. As I said before, today we are well above 400,000 who are counted as if they are part of the population of the Palestinians here in the area, but they are, uh, they are not. Uh, if I move fast forward, because I see the clock is running faster than I uh, would like it to, to be, we're talking about the Arab fertility rate in Judea and Samaria, which also impacts the number of Arab birth. And we can see that, that during the last few years, here I have only up to 2016, but for the last 10 years, it has been basically more or less the same, not dramatic increases of the number of babies while the population expands. And the reason is the fertility rate is coming down. The latest, the latest documentation by the CIA World Factbook for the Palestinians in uh, the West Bank in Judea, Samaria, is three babies per woman. To give you an idea, back in 1969, it was about nine babies per woman. Today, three babies, which is lower than Jewish women in, uh, in Israel. We're talking about uh, uh, the level or the number of uh, birth, and we found out, as you can see uh, here, green is the number of birth per the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics. In the red, it's the number per Palestinian Health uh, Ministry. Uh, our team had a debate with the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics at the Neeman Institute in the Haifa Technion, and when we presented that document, the head of the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics had no problem to explain the gap. He said, sure, our Palestinian health ministry does not count overseas birth. Well, that's the way it should be done. By the way, since that debate, since that debate, the Palestinian health ministry, so to speak, has caught up 
with the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, they also now report overseas uh, birth. And we're talking about the World Bank. The World Bank conducted a study in September of 2006, and you can see the second uh, line. They provided us with the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics projection. They projected 24% increase in the number of six-year-old registering to first uh, grade. It's very important to know the number of people in first grade in the West Bank and Gaza, because according to old studies, first, second uh, grades, there are no, uh, uh, everybody finishes the school, there's no dropout rate. First grade will tell you how many were born six years uh, ago. The Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics presents its numbers in according with the assumption of a 24% increase in the number of births six years earlier. But the World Bank third line tells us that its auditing showed not 24% increase, but an 8% decline. That's a 32% gap. 32% gap is quite a gap when it comes to the reporting of birth in this uh, area. And we're talking about uh, net migration. The Palestinians reported until again, we uh, came on board of the uh, demographic scene. They used to report every year, as you can see here with red, net immigration all the way to 50,000 and above every single year. It didn't look to us uh, to be accurate because why would people come uh, to an area which is not exactly the most stable area, the most uh, uh, economically attractive uh, area, and we started to uh, audit. It was very easy because all border passages document in a computerized manner every single day, entries and exits. We found out that every year there has not been net immigration every year, there has been net emigration. In recent uh, years, Judea and Samaria alone, the West Bank alone, we're talking about 20,000 net emigration every single year. Gaza, we don't have any figures because ever since Israel disengaged from uh, Gaza, there is no uh, real count of exits and entries, but anyone, anyone who follows the movement of Arabs from Gaza, there's hardly any movement into Gaza, uh, would conclude that emigration has escalated rapidly and dramatically, but we don't have figures, so we don't post those uh, figures. But again, the gap between 50,000 net immigration to uh, 20,000 net emigration is quite a gap, which is part of the artificially inflated Palestinian uh, number. And then we're talking about Arabs in the West Bank mostly, and Arabs in uh, Gaza marrying Israeli Arabs. As this uh, chart shows, until November 2003, as you can see the second line uh, here below the map, until November 2003, it was automatic process. An Arab from West Bank, Judea, Samaria, or Gaza marrying an Israeli Arab, receiving either permanent residency or citizenship. And we found out, as we audited, on the coattail of that uh, residency or citizenship, they used to bring to Israel for similar documentation, also the second wife and the third wife and the children. All that stopped uh, after November 2003. But until then, some 105,000 Arabs received such documentation, which means they are counted among Israeli Arabs, but they are also counted among 
Palestinian uh, Arabs, and therefore there is a double count of over 100,000. That's not the only over uh, double count. We have in Jerusalem some 350,000 Arabs. Those 350 Arabs are Israeli citizens, minority of them, or Israeli permanent residents, the vast majority of them. As such, they are counted among the 1.9 million Israeli Arabs. But the Palestinian Authority says, hell no, they are Palestinians, and therefore they are also counted as Palestinians, hence a double count of 350,000 Arabs in Jerusalem, a double count of over 100,000 Arabs who married Israeli uh, Arabs. That's in addition to over 400,000 who are abroad but are counted as if they are mostly in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank, in addition to a highly inflated number of birth, in addition to a non-reporting of net emigration. We had, a, as I mentioned before, a debate with the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics at the Israeli Technion, and we showed them the actual well-documented figures of net emigration. The response was very interesting. To their credit, they said, we uh, do not ignore your documentation, and therefore, as of next week, we will stop reporting net immigration. We will report zero net migration. We told them there is no such thing as zero net migration. No country has the same number of exits and entries. There is either net emigration or net immigration. Their response was a wide smirk on the face of the head of the Palestinian Center of Bureau of Statistics. He said, when we shall control the international passages, we will report the actual number. Until then, it's zero. The sad commentary or the sad fact is that the following week, they deducted 250,000 Arabs from the count of their census. And guess what? Official Israeli figures of West Bank Arabs went down by 250,000. Official international figures, just like just, uh, just like the, the U.S. Census Bureau, U.S. CIA, the U.N. agencies, they also came down by 250,000. Anyone who doubted, who was not sure that, they, that the world reverberates the Palestinian numbers rather than auditing them, received here a pretty good uh, evidence. We're talking basically about a pie of Jews and Arabs in our area. And in the middle, it's the pie which combines the pre-67 area of Israel and Judea and uh, Samaria. And if we, this is, uh, this are the 2016 uh, data, but if we talk about 2020, we're talking about seven, uh, 7.2 million uh, Jews 1.9 million Arabs in Israel, 1.8 million Arabs in uh, Judea and Samaria in the West uh, Bank, and that basically gives us 65 and a half, 66 percent Jewish uh, majority in the combined area of Judea, Samaria, and the pre-67 uh, line of Israel. Anyone who is alarmed by such a, a so to speak, small majority uh, should not be alarmed because uh, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, we have to rely on history. We have to rely on past experience. In 1900, when Theodore Herzl, and you can see on the right hand of the document, when he decided to pursue the Zionist idea, there was 9% Jewish minority in the combined area of the West Bank and pre-67 Israel. In 1947, when the UN approved the part 
competition uh, plan, it was a 39% minority in the combined area of the West Bank and 367 Israel. Today we are 65 and a half or 66 percent Jewish majority and as you can see in the next few minutes with a robust tailwind of fertility and robust tailwind of net immigration while the Arabs experienced a rapidly westernized, westernized fertility and also net emigration. Also, when Ben-Gurion accepted the partition plan in the area allotted to Jews in the 1947 partition plan, it was nearly 55% Jewish majority. As I mentioned before, he was urged to delay it, to accept it, because this supposedly would bode calamity for Jewish demography. Ben-Gurion was confident about uh, Jewish net immigration into Israel, uh, Aliyah, and Jewish fertility. He was right, and there is no reason for us to depart from his demographic uh, optimism. And certainly, when we talk about the trend of Arab demography in Judea and Samaria, here is a trend from 1950 to 2018. We did not choose 10 years or 15 years because this could be perceived as a subjective choice. Here you have the most realistic uh, curve, 1950, that's when the Jordanians occupied the West Bank, that's when they started publishing their statistics, demographic uh, statistics and documentation, and we can see that from 1950 through 1967, no change, 1% change in the number of Arabs in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank for a simple reason. The Jordanians did not develop infrastructures in the area, no education, no uh, employment, and no health and uh, medical infrastructures. And therefore, huge rate of emigration away, very, very high level of infant mortality, and very, very short life expectancy. As you can see here, from 67 all the way to more or less 1990, unprecedented, unprecedented growth of the number of Arabs in the area. Anyone who accuses Israel of apartheid in the area is detached completely from the reality. And there was a reason for that unprecedented growth of number of Arabs in the area. It was the outcome of unprecedented development of infrastructures in the area, education, transportation, employment, medicine, health, and, and, and also preventing or reducing the level of emigration from the area, because why emigrate when you have jobs? Also opening the border to uh, Arabs who wanted to come and work in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Jerusalem, anywhere in the, uh, in the country. The demographers were misled by that chart. They assumed that the chart will go up and up and up for many, many years. They forgot a cardinal rule of demography. As you can see here, there is a surge and then there is a fall. Anytime you have a Western society combined, integrated with a, with a third world society, the first generation, the first 20 years, 20 year plus are a year, are years of surge because of the infrastructure. And here again, infant mortality came down almost to the level of Jewish in, uh, of infant mortality. Life ex expectancy almost caught up with Jewish life expectancy. And equally important, emigration was reduced because of Israeli investment in the infrastructures of Judea Samaria. However, any time there is such an integration between third world and Western world societies, after a generation, after 20 years, 
we have also the phenomena of down, pre-fall surge took place and now comes the fall. The, the curve goes down. It goes down because of the impact of modernity, the westernization, the status of women has been enhanced dramatically. Uh, we are talking about better uh, uh, medicine, more and more uh, women pursue career. They don't want to uh, be reproductive uh, elements as they used to be. They do not start reproductive age until they finish their undergraduate, increasingly also graduate uh, studies. The bottom line, a remarkable down which we uh, witness uh, today. And we have seen it all over the Arab world, all over the Muslim world, as you can see here in this uh, document. Uh, you can see the third line, Iran. Today, 1.8 birth per woman. Iran, the ultra-radical Muslim society. Saudi Arabia, 2.1. Egypt, by the way, it's even less than 3.4 today. Jordan is less. Uh, Jordan right now is three uh, birth per woman. Syria, 2.5, etc. The Israeli Jewish fertility rate, to be exact, is 3.17 uh, uh, as uh, late as 2018. We don't have the 2019 figures yet, but 3.19, higher than Jordan, higher than Arabs in Israel, higher than Arabs in Judea and uh, Samaria. The only exception in the Muslim world are the sub-Sahara countries in Africa. But from Northwest Africa to the Gulf, westernization of Muslim fertility rate in contrast with conventional uh, wisdom. And here we come to Israel before 67. Look at this uh, document. To the left, you see 1965 through 1969, 9.22 birth per Arab woman, six birth more than a Jewish woman. But in 2015, to the right of the document, you can see 2015, for the first time, there is equal birth fertility rate for Arab and Jewish women, 3.13. And from 2015 onward, Jewish fertility rate higher than uh, Arab fertility rate. I mentioned before the westernization, but why would Jews in Israel behave differently than other Western societies when it comes to fertility rate, especially of economically, educationally successful families? And the answer is in the most fundamental elements of the Jewish society in uh, Israel. High level optimism, even during times of war and terrorism, high level uh, rate of patriotism, high level attachment to roots, and high level of communal national solidarity, whether you're left or right, a hawk or a dove, uh, uh, Likud or blue and, and white, whatever, those elements have characterized the vast majority of uh, Israelis, which obviously bring us back to this uh, day of uh, commemorating our fallen soldier. This is part of the high level solidarity uh, which we have uh, been endowed with. The actual number of birth are uh, documented uh, here from 1995 through 2019. There has been, there has been a slight decline in 2019 compared to 2018 because uh, there's no unlimited increase in the number of birth. You have to come to a stage where you start producing less babies, but still compared to 1995, 72.5% in the number of births among Jews in Israel. No country in the world, third world or Western world, 
uh, can pride itself with such a phenomena. At the same time, as you can see here with the red part of the graph, Arabs remain more or less the same. There has been an 18% increase from 1995, 18% compared to 72.5%. And in actual number per, uh, per person, it means that uh, there, there have been, in, or it, there were in 2019, 3.2 Jewish births for every one Arab birth in, uh, in uh, Israel. And here we see, again, few figures. The Jews west of the Jordan River, 3.17 in 2008. 3.17 birth per woman. 3.4 is the number of birth per woman where both wife and husband are Israeli born. It's a very important figure because increasingly more and more couples are Israeli born. And when both uh, um, mates are Israeli born, it's higher than the average today, which is very, very high compared to any Western or most third world uh, countries. At the same time, Arabs in Judea and Samaria, they had five babies per woman in 2000, it's three babies per woman today, and the trend is decline. Why decline? Urbanization has picked up very, very uh, strikingly uh, among Arabs in Judea, Samaria. Education has picked up remarkably in that uh, area, and certainly when you move from the village to the big city, uh, you don't need so many helping hands in the city as you need when you are in the village and when you live in floor number 7 or 13 or 15 in Ramallah or Hebron or Nablus, it's not as easy to raise many children as it was when you were in a, in a village. Arabs in pre-67 Israel had also about five births per woman in 2000. Today, three or to be exact 3.04 uh, slightly less than the number of jews of birth per jewish uh, women and to conclude my presentation before we move into question and answers uh, i'll refer to a person who audited our own work before we uh, published it back in 2005 uh, Dr. Nick uh, Eberstadt, Nicholas Eberstadt from the American Enterprise Institute, one of the top experts on Islamic global uh, demography. He examined our work for a few months before we, uh, we, we published it. And I think the key uh, element of his uh, audit was when he said, and you can see in the first and second line of his report, that we caught the demographic profession asleep at the switch. And he also admitted in a private conversation that he was also asleep as well, because he said some uh, 25 years before the publication of our work, he wrote an article bemoaning the future of the Jewish state. He also believed that we had no demographic future. And he said, Yoram, I was also caught asleep at the uh, at the switch the bottom line there is no room for pessimism there's no room for fatalism there's room for much optimism when it comes to uh jewish demography in uh in israel and i would say uh this is also something that we should take with us when it comes to confronting health uh, challenges you cannot fight any challenge with pessimism you have to be optimist uh, and uh, consider any challenge uh, or any crisis an opportunity in uh, disguise. Uh, I would like to end here and, and now uh, respond to any questions, assuming you have uh, some questions. Right. Um, we might run a little over than our allotted time frame because many, many questions have come in as you've been speaking. Um, 
but I would like to take the liberty as a moderator of asking you the first question, and that is in America um, right now, in many, many think tanks, I've heard this, this doom and gloom about the demographic time bomb of the Palestinians. Um, in Israel, do, do people still believe this quite as much, number one? And number two, after the Gaza withdrawal and um, all of the violence that ensued and the incendiary devices on the balloon bouquets and the kites, et cetera, um, is there still such an eagerness among the left wing in Israel for withdrawals? Uh, could you just uh, clarify the first part of your question, please? Um, how many um, Israelis still believe in this demographic time bomb, the myth of the demographic? What person? And uh, among the left wing Israelis? There's no doubt that since the publication of our study, for the first time, in fact, for the first time, there has been a growing voice of uh, Israelis who are much more confident in our demographic uh, future. I know from my own experience, many people on the left, uh, media, academia, politicians, uh, are convinced that indeed there is no room for shaky uh, knees when it comes to uh, discussing the demographic, demographic future. Sadly, however, this argument of uh, Arab demographic time bomb has been employed by people who want Israel out of uh, Judea Samaria, out of the West uh, Bank, and they assume, and they assume that this is a most effective tool irrespective of its uh, validity. My own attempt has been to convince them while showing them uh, our PowerPoint that uh, they, they don't need uh, to do that. Uh, they can talk about any other argument, but when you talk about demographic pessimism, potentially you can weaken the resolve of many, many Israelis. And we need strong resolve in order to face the wrath of terrorism, the, the, the threat of Iranian assault, the threat of, who knows, future regimes in countries around uh, us, and therefore we should do our utmost not to deflate optimism in Israel, but rather strengthen the sense of uh, optimism. As far as uh, Israelis who believe uh, that there is a room for agreement uh, with people in uh, Gaza, or there is a room for negotiation, uh, just like any other issue. Uh, we have a um, few schools of thoughts. This has been, I believe, one of the stronger part of Jewish societies throughout history. We encourage uh, a diverse, diversity of opinion. It's sometimes it's frustrating, and in the long run, it sharpens our uh, mind. My own my own uh, opinion is that there is no room for negotiation with uh, Hamas terrorists or with any uh, terrorist. Because if I would use the metaphor of a cake, uh, we sit down and discuss uh, the fate of a cake with the counterpart. What part of the cake do you think is yours? When it comes to Hamas, in fact, when it comes to the PLO, when it comes to the Palestinian Authority, according to their own education, according to their own track record, before 1967, since 1967, they're not interested in a slice of the cake or few slices of the cake. They're interested in the whole cake. The issue is not the size of the Jewish state. The issue is the existence of the Jewish state in what they believe is the abode of Islam, where there is no room for sovereignty of the so-called infidel. Uh, anyone who wants to understand how entrenched is that idea, which to many of us in the Western world sounds outdated, irrelevant, why talk about infidel and believers? Well, folks, this is the Middle East. In the Middle East, 
the fundamentals of Islam are very strong. In fact, in recent years, they have become even stronger and stronger. And under the cardinal tenets of uh, Islam, the globe is divided between the believers and the infidel. The faith of the infidel is very clear, submission, either peacefully or through the sword, through military uh, means. And yes, the believer, so to speak, is allowed to sign agreements with the infidel, in this case, uh, Israel, like the Oslo uh, Accord, but the believer has to keep his mind on the goal. And the goal is to bring the infidel to submission. And therefore, any agreement with an infidel is not an end of conflict, it's only truce, it's only temporary ceasefire. And the sooner we realize it, the more realistic we will be about our confrontation with various terrorists. And the same thing applies to those in Israel, in the US, in the Western world. We assume that certain gestures, economic gestures, trade balance uh, gestures, educational gestures with ro two rogue regimes would or could alleviate their anti-Western, anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish sentiments. They do not view those gestures as water to the fire. They welcome it as more fuel to the fire. They interpret such gestures as weakness, and weakness only whets the appetite of the rogue regime. Right. Right. Okay. Many questions have come in. Um, we can stay on a bit longer because so many questions have come in and I don't think it's fair for our audience, our audience viewers um, not to have a chance to ask. Is that okay with you, Yoram, to, to remain? Okay. Um, Sarah Leo, would you like to read some of the questions that have come in? In fact, I would welcome uh, people addressing the questions uh, to me even after this uh, session. Uh, my email address is uh, yoramtex uh, at gmail.com, and I'll be very happy to get your question. In fact, the more critical the questions, the more appreciated it will be. Okay, Sarah Wonderful, thank you. And if for the remainder of the webinar, Yoram, if you could close out your screen share um, so that everyone can get a full view of you responding to the questions, that would be perfect. Great, thank you. Okay, so the first question we have, um, do you find differences in fertility rates or different patterns between Israeli Arabs and non-Israeli Arabs? And is there a difference between the Christian Arabs and the Muslim Arabs? Absolutely. Uh, Muslim Arabs have slightly, not much, slightly higher fertility rate, maybe number of birth per woman than Christian Arabs or then Druze. The Druze are not really Arabs. The Druze are, as many of you uh, know, are different in that regard. The Druze population, which is not Jewish, however, from 1948 until today, they have been an integral part of the uh, land of Israel. They have been an integral part of the is Israel Defense Forces. More than that, uh, the number of fallen Druze soldiers per capita is higher than the number of fallen Jewish soldiers per capita. They, they serve in combat units uh, and they have been integrated all throughout the Israeli society. But again, the Druze and the Christians have lower fertility rate uh, than the Muslims. Uh, Muslims have come down dramatically as well, but not as uh, low as the Christians and uh, and uh, Druze elements in Israel. Sorry. Thank you so much for that. The next question we have, given the demographic growth of the Arab and ultra-Orthodox cohorts, we already see in Greater Jerusalem, what can be described as a which can be described as a non-Zionist majority. Um, if this trend continues, what are the prospects of a non 
Zionist majority in Israel's future. Sorry if that was a little choppy. I, I, th I think anyone who considers the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel as anti-Zionist uh, or uh, putting them together with uh, Arabs uh, displays uh, detachment, detachment from the reality in Israel. There are, there are uh, tiny, very, very extremist, ultra-Orthodox element who do not reflect, do not reflect the overwhelming majority of the ultra-Orthodox community and that tiny uh, element is by nature defiant, defiant of any authority, even other ultra-Orthodox rabbis. They have been against the idea of a humanly established Jewish state. According to them, it must be done without human intervention. It must be done only by, uh, by divine uh, intervention. As far as the vast majority of the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, we have seen in the last 20 years a substantial growth in the integration of the ultra-Orthodox in different facets of the Israeli society, mostly employment. They did not used to be part of the employment sector. They are now increasingly in the employment sector, not yet in sufficient uh, numbers, but compared to 20 years ago, very substantial increase. We have seen in recent years more and more ultra-Orthodox youngsters pursuing graduate and undergraduate degrees following their religious school or yeshiva, as we call uh, that. We have seen, again, not in sufficient numbers, also uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox folks joining the Israeli uh, military. Uh, there are very substantial ultra-Orthodox uh, towns, uh, few of them uh, in Judea and Samaria, like uh, Upper Beitar and Upper Modin, some 50,000 each, and they have been an integral part of the security and civilian presence in uh, Judea and Samaria. We have uh, ultra-Orthodox units of the Israel Defense Forces that patrol Judea and Samaria, that are in counter-terrorist uh, units. And again, to refer to them as part of the anti-Zionist camp, I think reflects ignorance or maybe even uh, ill intention against uh, Israel. As far as Arabs at the same time, it's a major mistake to refer to all Arabs as anti-Israel. The fact is, to give you an example, that last uh, election cycle, we have an all-time record of Arab uh, turnout on election day, some 60 or 63 percent, which is very respectable uh, compared to previous uh, uh, level of participation, but still 25 to 30 percent lower than Arab turnout on local election day. And the reason that they turn out in much higher percentage during local election is because they do not identify with the anti-Zionist Arab party at the Israeli legislature, the Knesset. The Arab party in the Knesset reflects maybe around 50% of the Arabs in, uh, in Israel. Uh, Nazareth, for instance, which is the largest Arab town in Israel, has had a mayor, I think for the last eight or nine years, he defeated, he defeated some eight years ago, a mayor who was there almost forever, almost forever, Jeraisi. That mayor was anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, pro-PLO, pro-Palestinians, heralding Palestinian uh, terrorists. The current mayor challenged him, and the motto of his election was, I care about Nazareth more than I care about the Palestinian Authority. He won some 60% of the vote. By the way, his name is Salam, Salem, uh, close to uh, peace. 
but he reflects a growing number of Arabs. You visit today Israeli hospitals, more and more Arab doctors, more and more head of the depart departments are Arabs, more and more chief nurses are Arab. You stop by pharmacies in Israel, and almost every pharmacy has head pharmacists who are Arabs. You, uh, you visit uh, campuses in Israel, Hebrew University, Haifa University, Technion, more and more Arabs. I mention all that because opposing the Arab party does not mean being anti-Arab. It means being anti those who are enemies of the country, who herald Palestinian terrorists. And I think they have no room in uh, Israeli politics. Our uh, judiciary decided that they do have room and we respect it. But they're absolutely wrong to assume that anyone who is against the anti-Zionist Arab party is therefore anti-Arab. It's simply not true. I think we might have time for one more question. Many, many have come in. So I think what um, we're gonna encourage people to do is to send their questions to you, Yoram, or to me and I'll forward them to you. Okay, Sarah Leah, one more question and mm -hmm. then we'll wrap up. Sure, and just to reiterate, I included Yoram's email in um, the chat, but in case you missed it, it's yoram.text at gmail.com, Y-O-R-A-N dot T-E. No dot? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Glad we clarified, just Yoram text then. So I'll write it out again, Yoram text. Great. Perfect. Glad we specified. So the last question we have, have you done any birth rate increase studies on recent families who have made Aliyah and how many of them have had children born in Israel? Okay. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, the fertility rate among uh, families in Israel where both spouses are Israeli born is slightly higher. Fertility rate among uh, Jews who arrived to Israel is slightly lower than the, the average. However, when you look at the one million uh, Jews who arrived to Israel from the former Soviet Union, in fact, about one and a quarter uh, million, upon arrival to Israel, they brought with them a very, very low level of fertility of the Soviet Union, one point something. The second generation, already added one uh, birth. Currently, the uh, families of uh, former uh, Jews who came from the Soviet uh, Union are almost in touch with the average fertility rate in, uh, in Israel. And once again, it's the integration, the integration into the Israeli society. Going back to our founding father, Ben Gurion, when he confronted the pessimism expressed by the demographic and statistic uh, establishment, he said, I trust, he said, that Jews in Israel will follow in the footsteps of Jews who reside in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, who had higher fertility rate than Jews who were in Europe at that time. And once again, his argument was dismissed by the professionals, but now in hindsight, we know the non-demographer, non-statistician founding father Ben-Gurion was much more in touch with reality than was the uh, profession. And as I started, I would uh, urge everyone here, please uh, do not allow yourself to be swept by conventional wisdom and sacrifice reality on the altar of wishful thinking. Reality is not always convenient. Reality is not always attractive. In fact, in the Middle East, reality is quite disruptive, quite disappointing, quite frustrating. But that's the reality. That's the, we don't have any other reality. And the closer we are to reality, the closer we will be to more optimistic uh, future. Uh, thank you very much. And most importantly, obey the social distancing instructions 
and stay uh, healthy. A tremendous amount of attendance. Um, thank you so much. Um, this was a wonderful way um, to go into Young Ops Mullet with a bit of um, realistic optimism. Um, I'd like um, to repeat if you have more questions because many came in that we didn't have time to get to, um, you could email Urim directly, urimtext at gmail.com. Also, just a few announcements. Um, as you know, tonight is Yom Hazikaron, um, and tomorrow at this time, um, we, and tomorrow is Yom Hatzmut, um, but tomorrow at this time we are having, uh, tonight is Yom Hatzmut, yes, tonight is Yom Hatzmut. Um, um, we are having a wonderful um, speaker, Ari Katz, from a phenomenal organization called Ha'emet Shali, My Truth. Um, these are reservists who've all been through army service and they go to US college campuses and um, talk about the truth and the moral clarity of the IDF. And unfortunately, um, Ari, he served with distinction in the war in Lebanon in 2006 and was wounded in a terrorist attack in 2018. And he should be a very compelling speaker. Um, I'd also like one other announcement. Um, First of all, this will be on our webinar, on, on our website, and um, as all of our, ours are, we have had many, many webinars since the beginning of this quarantine, um, and one speaker is as interesting and compelling as the next. You can find them all there. Um, um, Benjamin Wheel and I have been incredibly busy. We have about six um, average on conference calls a day with staffers and members of um, Congress. Um, and I, I, I would like to make an announcement that May 5th um, is Giving Tuesday, a new Giving Tuesday. So please remember our good work on Giving Tuesday. All of us, um, unfortunately, are suffering because of this pandemic. We will not be able to have our dinner this year because of this crisis, which is our only fundraising event of the year. So I, I'm going to ask you to please remember us on Giving Tuesday on May 5th. Anyway, thank you so much, Yerem. Always a pleasure to thank hear you. My pleasure. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye.